Hi, welcome to Deep Run Church Online. My name is Brian Lopiccolo. It's good to have you with us. If you're used to being with us in person on Sunday, sorry that didn't work out this week. My family and I are quarantining uh, because of COVID. So um, we just decided, the elders and I decided it'd be simplest for all of our vo volunteers who have been spread thin through the pandemic and through uh, the difficult weather um, in, in uh, this winter, it would just be better if we had a virtual service today. So that's what we're doing. We appreciate your patience. Let's begin. Our call to worship is taken from the beginning of Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's pray. Our great God, we worship you as a God of truth. We can trust you. And we worship you as a God of grace. We can come to you and draw near and receive forgiveness and hope. And as our creator and as our savior, we come to you now and ask that you would lead us uh, during these challenging times to worship you, to remind one another, to submit to your truth, even as we remind one another of it. Thank you for this opportunity to be together, even though it's only virtual. Uh, we praise you for your care for us, day in and day out. Your mercies are new every morning. We worship you today because you are worthy of it. We ask that you would teach us today how to be you are faithful witnesses in this world for your glory and for the good of our neighbors. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, 
Amen. Good morning, dear friend kids. I really miss being together with you in person this morning, but I'm glad that we can still connect in this way and worship together. Um, I'd like to start by asking a question, and normally in church I'd say raise your hand if, even if you're at home, you can still raise your hand if, you have ever been on a trip and you stayed somewhere like a hotel or an Airbnb or just somewhere that's not your home. Um, I really love doing that. I love to travel and I love to see new places and meet new people. And a lot of times when you are traveling, people will ask you where you're from. And so I got thinking about my family uh, before COVID and everything. We used to go to Virginia to visit some cousins and we stayed at a hotel called the Holiday Inn. And then we would go see some of the sites around Washington, D.C. And we were very obviously not from there. So people did ask where we were from. And I was thinking, how silly would it be if someone were to ask me while I was there, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from the Holiday Inn, room 205. That would be ridiculous because obviously that's not what they meant. But then I was thinking, wouldn't it be even crazier if then I started decorating my hotel room. I tell people I'm from the Holiday Inn and then I start picking out my paint colors and I hang up my favorite pictures on the walls and I move all my clothes into the closets and the drawers and bring in all my kids stuff. That would be crazy, right? Why would that be so ridiculous? Because that's not my house. It's not permanent. And in the same way, God tells us in the Bible that this world is not our home. In the grand scheme of eternity, we really will not be here for that long. So it's silly for us to get attached to things like our toys and our clothes and the sports teams we play on or cheer for, or even the country that we live in. All of these things are really great and God gave them to us to enjoy but like that hotel room, none of them are going to last for very long. If we love Jesus, the Bible tells us that he is preparing a place for us in heaven and that will be our home forever. And so God tells us to store up our treasures in heaven by loving him and loving other people in our short time here on earth. So let's pray together that he would help us to do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for all of the children who are watching and listening. Father, I thank you for the lives that you have given us here on earth and all of the wonderful things you've given us to enjoy. But Lord, I pray that you will help us to remember that these things are only temporary and none of them will last forever, Lord, but that your kingdom is forever and that if we love you and we follow you, that you have prepared a home for us in heaven and that that is where we will live forever. So Lord, as we go throughout our week, please help us to remember to love you and love other people above everything else. In your name, amen. Let's just spend a minute confessing our sin, our brokenness, our weakness to our God, who we find out in scripture is a God that forgives. Our Lord, uh, we very much are aware of our hearts, how we think, our actions, our words, not only what, uh, what is seen, but what is unseen, not only what is heard, but what is unheard. Father, we are aware that uh, we think and act and speak often for our own good, for our own advantage. Uh, we often um, act in anger uh, when we are hurt by others, and, and we also think selfishly and act selfishly to protect our own interests or our own people when others truly need our help and when others truly need encouragement and friendship. Uh, Father, forgive us for being so self-seeking and self-protective and prideful of our own way of looking at the world. Help us to humble ourselves so that you would be king in our hearts. I pray that others would see uh, that uh, although we may disagree with them respectfully, we serve and worship you alone. I pray that you would equip us to be your ambassadors, your representatives here in Westminster, Maryland, wherever we work and wherever we go. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is not only our example of how to live as a servant, but who is our Lord, who is our King, who is our Savior, because he gave up his own life that we should have life. We thank you for his sacrificial servant's heart. And we ask 
now that you have brought us into your family because of his sacrifice in our place. Now give us a desire to become like him. Amen. Now in response to God's forgiveness and grace and mercy, um, the fact that he receives us even though we don't deserve it, let's profess our faith by looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I'm sorry, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Today I'm going to be speaking from Daniel chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 24. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error for fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house, where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement, and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near, and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and set his mind to deliver Daniel and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and slept and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions 
As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. This is God's true word. Daniel's first experience of Babylon was as an exiled teenager, a refugee, under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, um, whose famous Ishtar Gate and processional way leading to the Ishtar Gate, as we've seen in weeks past, uh, was arrayed with beautiful, fierce lions. Uh, lions were revered in Mesopotamian cultures. The kings would hunt them uh, as a sport and a show of strength. But the lion to the ancients in that part of the world was a symbol of the god Ishtar, the female god of war and sexuality and wisdom. So lions were symbols of strength, power, and dominance. Many decades later, long after Daniel's teenage years, He's in his 80s. He's an old man living under a new administration. It's the empire of the Medes and the Persians had just taken over Babylon. And now Daniel's about to face as an old man real lions, no longer glazed in bricks on a wall. But this was the real thing. But once again, God is about to prove his supremacy over the gods of Babylon and Persia through the witness of Daniel. This time, and Daniel's, Daniel and his friends have been through uh, adversity before, um, but this time the issue was a matter of the civil law in conflict with God's law. Now we've been looking at how the book of Daniel can show people of faith how they can flourish even in very challenging settings. How people of faith in this God of the Bible can flourish in an environment that is unsympathetic to their faith unsympathetic to a biblical worldview or a Christian worldview. Now, in today's tumultuous American society, how should Christians regard an issue like civil disobedience, especially in the last several months, the last few years? Uh, this is a hot topic that's come up. Uh, civil disobedience, how to engage, uh, when to or when not to engage. What do we think of civil disobedience in a society that is um, getting more and more polarized and tense. Well, uh, before we dive into this, to see what Daniel chapter 6 says, I've got, I've got to clarify something. The Apostle Peter said to Christians in the late first century AD, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A holy nation, right? So according to Jesus and the Apostles in the New Testament, the only Christian nation, according to them, is the church. The only Christian nation is the church, the church with a capital C. Okay, so when Christians think that they live in a Christian nation, what tends to happen with that mentality is they begin to act like natives, natives in their own country, right? They begin to act like the place is their own and begin to think that others must conform to their expectations, to their way of life, to their worldview. The problem with that way of thinking is that the Bible doesn't encourage it. So Daniel becomes, reading the book of Daniel, understanding life and faith from Daniel's perspective becomes critical for thinking about issues such as civil disobedience within a secular society, within a society that is becoming more and more secular, okay? So civil disobedience in a secular setting. 
Well, what we need to see from Daniel is that Christians must think more like exiles than natives in any political context. If you were with us last year when we took a look at how the gospel of Christianity impacts our politics as citizens of a nation in this world, this message is going to sound very familiar to you. But Christians must think like exiles rather than think like natives in any political context. And we're going to look at Daniel and we're going to talk about Daniel's response to the hostility that he faced. And we're going to talk about our response to hostility in our setting. And then we're going to talk about God's response to hostility. Daniel's response, our response, and how God responded to hostility against him. Now, Daniel's method of response to hostility is a better model. I'm going to try and show that to you. Daniel's, let's start with the setting. Daniel's distinguished political career, many decades, was in his old age sabotaged yet again by the envy of his colleagues. Right? There's jealousy. So we're told in Daniel chapter 6 that uh, the, the new regime, the, the empire of the Medes and the Persians, sets 120 satraps, basically governors of provinces. 120 of them, right? And they all report to a higher cabinet of three high officials, whom Darius, King Darius, intends to appoint over them Daniel as sort of a chief of staff, Okay, so, so now historically, just as an aside, historically, we don't really know who Darius the Mede is. Some scholars believe Darius the Mede is another, phrase, is another title for Cyrus the Great, whom we know conquered the Babylonians in 539 BC. Darius the Mede could just be another, phrase, another title for Cyrus the Great. Uh, some scholars believe it was one of Cyrus's governors, the governor of Babylon, G uh, Babylon G Gabaru. It also could have been one of Cyrus's conquering generals. We're really not sure. So in the same way that King Belshazzar in chapter 5, you know, Belshazzar's true identity was not revealed by archaeology until the 1850s. Some people thought it was a myth. There was a Belshazzar, uh, but it, it took many, many centuries for the historical record to reveal uh, that, that Daniel's witness was indeed accurate. So in this situation, we're also just going to have to be patient until there's more evidence on, on who this Darius the Mede was. Uh, but it's reasonable that it was actually Cyrus uh, or one of his leading officials. Okay, regardless of who Darius the Mede was, Daniel found himself in a new position under a new sovereign in a newly forming government. A lot of transition. And his powerful colleagues conspire against him. That's what it means when you see the words came by agreement in verses 6 and 15. They come in agreement to the king against Daniel. But here's the thing. Because Daniel had, as verses 3 and 4 say, an excellent spirit in him. And because he was faithful, the text says, these guys can't dig anything up on Daniel. Nothing. Nada. Right? There's, they, find, they, they can't find any political dirt. They can't find any personal conspiracy. Uh, uh, there's nothing. Daniel's record, personal, private, political, public, is clean, squeaky clean, right? So they have to devise a trap for Daniel. Uh, they basically create an edict that will force Daniel to have to choose between the law of the land and the law of his God. Okay, so, so here is the manipulative edict that they bring uh, in conspiracy to King Darius. Uh, verse 7, Whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, why would Darius fall for something like this? I don't think it's because he had the type of ego that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had many decades before him. Doesn't seem to be a Nebuchadnezzar type of a guy. Uh, actually, he doesn't even share Nebuchadnezzar's style of government. Right? One, one person points out, Nebuchadnezzar was ruling an absolute monarchy. Right? He could do as he pleased. Uh, he, could, he could execute or save as he pleased, as Daniel said to Belshazzar in chapter 5. 
right? Nebuchadnezzar was um, at his worst a tyrant and as his best an absolute king. Um, this is a bit different. The Medes and the Persians, according to Daniel, they seem to, to have set up a constitutional monarchy, right? Because Darius, who's king, right, once he realizes the impact of this new law on Daniel, what? He's distressed and he can't reverse it. He can't change his own law. Rather, it seems that Darius took the bait, that he was manipulated because he saw in this edict a means of testing the loyalty within his new administration, right? So, so it seems that, that Darius responds to this. He doesn't realize he's being manipulated, but he likes the edict because it gives him an opportunity to see, are people going to be faithful to me? Are, are my officials going to obey my laws? Can I trust them? Right? Well, apparently, at least one of his appointees, his chief appointee, had higher loyalties. Now, Daniel's response to the new law was carefully recorded for future generations of Hebrews who would be subjugated by one empire after another. Listen to how Daniel responded. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. It's interesting to note here that his response wasn't public, it wasn't organized, it wasn't oppositional in nature, but neither was it secretive or maliciously subversive. He continued to live by faith as he had done all along for decades. He continued to live by faith uh, with the windows open, as one author likes to say. Living by faith with the windows open. He rendered to God the things that are God's in such a way that other people noticed. All right, so it wasn't public, but it wasn't secretive either. And I think what you have here is, is the kernel, uh, the seed of a biblical way of looking at civil disobedience. Here's just a potential definition for civil disobedience from a Christian perspective. When a society's laws or social pressures force a direct compromise to one's calling to love God and love one's neighbor, the believer continues in faithfulness to God's law. The reason Daniel's response to hostility is a better model for us is because though Daniel loses everything, everything except his life, and it looked like he was going to lose his life, though Daniel loses almost everything, he keeps his integrity. And that's critical. Now, integrity is what religious people lose in the sight of their secular culture. Integrity is what religious people lose when they respond to hostility with hostility. Um, a Christian response to hostility must, uh, to use a phrase, take plays from Daniel's playbook. Okay, Daniel is a great example of how Christians can respond to hostility. And we see that Daniel's perspective, Daniel's model, is, is what the apostles adopt in the early church in the first century in the Mediterranean world. So, uh, verse 5, this is what the conspirators say about Daniel. We shall not find any ground for complaint against him unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Okay, so, a Christian's character and reputation should be so above reproach within the community, in the world, that your devotion to God is the only noticeable thing that your adversaries can pick on. If your adversaries are picking on your personality, if people are picking on your habits or your policies or your politics, then you need to make some changes. If they're picking on any of those things, 
you had better reassess your commitments, where your loyalties lie, and how you think about these things. The um, Old Testament scholar, Tremper Longman, in his commentaries on Daniel, he mentions that this lion's den method of, uh, of, uh, of uh, criminal justice, basically, this lion's den method resembles the water tests or water ordeals of the ancient Middle East. For instance, um, an accused person's innocence or guilt would be determined by whether, whether or not they would drown if, if thrown into uh, a river uh, or a body of water. Uh, if the person would drown, then the community deemed them guilty. If they survived the test of water, uh, the community considered them uh, to be innocent. Now that sounds superstitious, you know, kind of like um, seeing if an alleged witch uh, would float or sink or something like that. But I want you to think about the Old Testament and the context in which it was written. Think about Noah and the ark being rescued from the waters. Think about the people of Israel being rescued from the Red Sea while the Egyptians drown in it, right? What do you see happening throughout the Old Testament Again and again, you see the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, proving himself to the nations of the world by vindicating and saving his own people out of such tests. Okay, so from the Mesopotamian mindset, Daniel endured the lions because Daniel's God was greater and because Daniel was, through that testing, proven to be innocent, right? That's the message to Darius and to the Medes and the Persians, that Daniel's God is greater and that Daniel, after all, was innocent. This is, this is the God of the Bible condescending to a, sec, to, to, to a pagan culture, right? And using their own law to prove his greatness and the faithfulness of his servant and the integrity of his servant. Okay, so um, Daniel was guilty by the law of the Medes and the Persians, but Daniel was morally innocent. And that's what Darius discovered when Daniel survived the lion's den. What does it say in verse 22? Daniel's response to Darius was, God saved me, why? Daniel said, because I was found blameless before God and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. There it is. So this clarifies what legitimate civil disobedience is from the perspective of the Bible. Are you resisting or disobeying civil law in a way that preserves your integrity and the reputation of the God you claim to worship and serve? In Nazi-occupied Holland, the Ten Boom family resisted out of a love for God and a love for their neighbors. Corey Ten Boom and her family were, were violating the civil law of, 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 their, um, of their oppressors, but out of a greater devotion to their God and a love for their fellow human beings. And as the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he calls Christians sojourners and exiles. And he says to them, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. By Gentiles there, he means unbelievers, right? Whether Jew or Gentile, those who do not follow Jesus. Um, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of Christian witness, especially in our trials, that even those who speak against you may see your good deeds and, and eventually be brought to see God's greatness and your integrity. So think about, if you are a Christian, think about life in this country in 21st century America. Think about life here from the perspective of an exile rather than a native. Live here as an exile rather than a native, okay? You're, you're an exile in a land that is not your own. You're not a native in your own place. 
an ambassador knows, a political ambassador knows what? That she lives and works as an alien representing her true country. And that's what we see in Daniel. And that's the Christian perspective. So in your own trials, whether in, in the trials of a people, like a group of Christians, or whether in your personal trials, if, if you ever experience any hostility in, in your environment, um, in our culture, in your family, where you work, in your community, any hostility because of your devotion to the God of the Bible. Do you think more like an ambassador of that God, or do you think more like a victim? Do you think like an ambassador, or do you think like a victim? Daniel's faithful living, his faithful work, his righteous reputation, his unjust suffering, and then his miraculous vindication all point to the fact that Daniel's whole life was lived to God as God's ambassador. He worked for the Medes and the Persians. He worked for the Babylonians, but he was God's ambassador. Now, now most of us know this, that parents will say... <laughs> In the, in the privacy of their own homes, parents will say to their kids, I hope you don't act like this in public. I hope you don't act like this at your friend's house. I hope you don't act like this in school. I hope you say excuse me when you do that. I hope you don't eat all the food in sight, right? I hope you're kind and respectful and say thank you. You better represent us well. Because what happens, you know, kids who are raised in, in a good environment, uh, they act like they own the place at home, right? Their guard is down, they're more relaxed, and unfortunately, they're more unruly if they think they own the place, right? But, but with some good training, they will be better behaved in other settings, right? Um, and, and so, again, I have to ask you, as a representative of the God you worship, do you think like his ambassador or do you think like a victim? When you experience any type of hostility, even if it's just verbal, even if it's just implied hostility, and sometimes it is direct uh, physical or political hostility, do you think like a victim instead? Right? Do you think like someone who has lost their rights and is demanding them back? Is, is, is it a tit for tat sort of a thing with you? If you think like a victim instead of like an ambassador, that will only lead to more hostility. But Daniel's identity as an exile liberated him from the demanding mentality of thinking he was a native, which he knew from when he was a teenager he wasn't. He was living as an exile in a foreign place. And that exile mentality liberated him to put God first and hold on to his integrity in extremely challenging situations. And I'm telling you, if you're, if you're a Christian, you must see that exile identity in God himself if you're ever going to embrace it. So you can say, yeah, Daniel lived thousands of years ago. Daniel was, a, you know, he was in the Old, Old Testament times. doesn't apply to me. Well, what I'm saying to you is your own God identified as an exile in a country that he was treated as a stranger. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus, God's one and only Son, was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. We discover that Jesus was rejected repetitively, consistently, from birth to his crucifixion, rejected, envied, hated, killed, unlike Daniel, killed by the establishment from Herod to the Sanhedrin, consistently rejected, envied, hated. But what do we discover? We discover that Jesus was consistently followed, embraced, loved by whom? by the lowly, by the marginalized, by those who knew that the place wasn't their own, by those who were not a part of the influential power structure of the setting. Those were the people that flocked to Jesus and loved him. 
Unlike Daniel, uh, Jesus was not rescued from the cross. He wasn't. Jesus endured the cross till the end so that you and I would not have to endure it. But like Daniel, Jesus emerged from a sealed tomb, a tomb that was, like Daniel's, sealed by the governing authorities. Jesus emerged from that cave alive. And what did that prove? It proved Jesus' innocence. It proved that Jesus is the greater God. Jesus is the ultimate vindicated exile. And that's what Jesus that's what God in Jesus was showing the world, that he is greater, that he is a God of integrity, of justice, but of mercy. So, when I say that Christians must think more like exiles than natives in any political or social context, what I mean is Christians must think more like Jesus and then their actions should follow. So if you're, if you're listening, if you're watching and you're not a Christian, I just wanna say I'm sorry that, that sometimes throughout history and, and today, we Christians act like we own the place. We don't. We don't own the place. Actually, God tells us in his word that he is preparing for us a better country to which he says we already belong, and why we live in this world to be productive citizens here. Um, the Bible teaches us to long for that better country that we will someday inherit when the Lord Jesus returns. And uh, I encourage you uh, to join us. Uh, we're, we're sinners. We're broken people too. Um, join us. I invite you to join us as we discover the depths of Jesus' power and mercy and become more like him. We invite you to learn from him who once said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, teach us how to think like those uh, who do not own or belong to the place where you have placed us within human history. Help us to be productive here. Help us to be servants of integrity and mercy and justice while we are here. But help us to long for the country that you have prepared for us to inherit someday. Help us, uh, like our brother Daniel uh, from thousands of years ago, to keep our integrity no matter what we may lose for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your name being promoted in this world. Help us to be your servants, your ambassadors, and forgive us for acting like spoiled natives who think we own this place. Help us to be servants like Jesus, who did own the place, uh, but acted, um, acted like somebody who came to be a servant and to give his life up for others. In his name, may we do the same. Amen.
bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first rise. Receive God's blessing. May the grace of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you are not a part of Deep Run Church and you'd like more information, you can find us at deeprunchurch.org. If you are not a Christian and you'd like to learn more about Jesus Christ or Christianity or the Bible, please reach out to us. We would love to interact. Also want to mention uh, those of you who are looking forward to visiting with some of our missionaries today in person. That event has been postponed until Sunday, April 11th. So please mark that on your calendars. Also want to mention if you're a part of our church family and you are on our email list, every once in a while I'm going to ask you, please check your spam or junk folders for any emails from us. Lately, Google has uh, been guarding against scams. Uh, so sometimes if, if, if you receive an email that's sent to a large group of people, um, the algorithms may put that in your junk folder or your promotional folder. So please, every once in a while, maybe at least once a week, just check those folders and make sure you haven't missed anything uh, that we've sent you. Thank you for being diligent about that. Finally, if you have any desire uh, to be so generous and give to Deep Run Church. I don't feel obligated to do that, but if you'd like to, you can go to deeprunchurch.org and um, there's a giving page where you can learn how to do that. That's it for this week. God bless you. Stay in touch. We'll tell you what's going to happen next Sunday sometime in the next few days. God bless you.